Oh, <coughs> oh, I got up in the middle of the night. <coughs> mm. oh. uh, sometimes I just can't sleep, but usually I sleep pretty good. Uh, but what time is it? Uh, 3.40 a.m. In, in, in New South Wales, Australia. All right. Uh, okay, this is for... Kent Kruger, my pal, I'm always disappointed when his videos don't go for more than 30, 40 minutes. I don't like those little eight-minute ones. Ah, I like to hear Kent talk for a long time. And that guy that's putting shit on him, I don't take any notice of people that don't put their photograph on a video, so... <laughs> It doesn't really count if, if your photograph is not up there, uh, you know, because you're just Mr. Anonymous. And anybody can talk like a hillbilly if they try hard enough, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, my radar was on 24 hours a day when I had a girlfriend, Leslie, especially amongst hippies, but because I knew from my time with my first girlfriend that prowling carnivorous males would pick up the scent of any female they thought they had a chance with. Caveman instincts were alive and active in the push. But Leslie's father was uh, Jack Armstrong, a respected horse race bookie and price assessor. He wrote the Sun Odds column for the newspaper and sold racing information. <coughs> he charged a fee for people... Uh, to get his racing information and uh, his clients loved him for his talent. He knew if a horse was trying or if it was just having a run for exercise. This gave him a better chance than most mug punters who, who try to find winners. But it was not infallible and pricing services for illegal bookies was frowned upon by the law. So Jack lived a bit of a Damon Runyon life and he knew the hoodlums, the wise guys, the jockeys and the private dicks and the politicians who gambled. He got the idea that to protect his only daughter from the dope-smoking hippie, which he thought I was, he'd either pay me to piss off to another state <coughs> or have me scared off. He asked his old friend and, and associate, private detective Tim Bristow, of Palm Beach, I think he lived Palm Beach in Sydney. He had a lovely house in Palm Beach. And, and Jack told Tim Bristow, take the prick for a ride and scare the shit out of him. Offer him 500 to piss off, which these days might be equal to 6,000. I'm not sure. But this was 67, and one balmy spring evening I was walking jointly through the cross thinking how great my life is now. I got a groovy chick and was a known respected hip cat. Opposite the old village wax museum, a bloke like Frankenstein began walking alongside me. I sped up, and so did he. I slowed down, and so did he. Thinking it was some square, <coughs> pardon me, we'll have a fag, <coughs> clear out my throat. See, the minute I start talking about private eyes and private detectives, I start feeling like a private detective. All right, so you'll have to excuse me. I just woke up in the middle of the night. <coughs> I'm not used to doing these things in the middle of the night. All right, so I thought he was trying to kid me, you know, having a bit of fun, you know, scaring the hippie. So I turned to him like and imitated the beatnik Maynard G. Krebs from the old TV show, Dobie Gillis Show. I said, like, hi, man. The big fella towered over me, and in a voice from hell, he said, Get in the bloody car. He took my arm and pushed me to a car. It was a black sedan parked outside the Paradise Strip joint. 
As he pushed me into the front seat, I saw the spruker of the paradise turn away so as not to be a witness. <coughs> Hang on while I have a fag. <coughs> do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Yeah, all right, here we go. He put me in the front seat. I saw the spruker turn away so as not to be a witness. And Bristow said, shut your face and don't move. Adrenaline flooded my system. He drove along Bayswater Road and I prepared to jump out at a traffic light. <coughs> but they were all green. I imagined how his big massive hand would yank me back if I tried. At the dark and silent White City tennis courts, right next to the Sydney Stadium, he stopped the car. He said, That Sheila you're seeing is the daughter of a good mate of mine. There's this money here for you. 500 quid or something. In here, if you piss off tonight and never see her again. Go to some other town and start your life again. If you don't, I'll give you a nice pair of boots. There's only one thing wrong with them. They're heavy because they're made from cement. You can't swim in them. Do you get me drift? Because you won't be drifting. You'll be outside the heads. Sydney Harbour heads. The fishies will eat your eyes. And your hippie mates will think you've gone fruit picking. He was right. My acquaintances would not think twice if I disappeared. I'd often gone interstate on a whim, but my head <coughs> could not wrap around leaving Leslie. She loved me. They're the first person since my mum, probably. And I thought of getting the money and then telling Liz. And then we could both go away together. And I was about to say, okay, give me the bread and I'll split. When the thought hit me, this might be a test. This might be a trap to see if I was scrupulous. Liz's dad might be testing me to see if I really love this girl. Maybe if I took the money, then I might be bumped off. I looked Bristow right in the eyes because I'd read somewhere that that's how you tell if a person is being honest, <coughs> <coughs> which is something I don't usually do because in Zen Buddhism, you, you, you lower your gaze quite often out of respect respect for someone but you know I forced myself to look him in the eyes and I used my sincere voice and I said you scare me man but I'm not leaving Leslie I'd rather be dead than leave her wondering why I'd gone I love her gigantically her dad might think I'm a dope fiend but I've never taken drugs I hate them I plead guilty to being a hippie a bit, but I'd never heard his daughter. And I'm starting work as a salesman next week at David Jones. That last bit was a lie, but a bit of humanity crossed his face for a second. So I prayed hard, silently, to God, not Buddha. I prayed silently to God. And he started the car. Vroom, vroom. Oh, shit, I thought he's taken me to the gap. That's a part of Sydney where people commit suicide by jumping into the Sydney Harbour. He's taken me to the gap to chuck me in the cold, dark, deep, dark, deep salty sea. <clears throat> and I made plans. Well, if he throws me in, I'll swim and climb ashore somewhere. But if he tries to kill me first, I'll go for his eyeballs and get me fingers right into his brain. 
Oh, shit, but he's so strong and big. And just when I'd psyched myself up, he turned the car around and drove back to King's Cross. And I be- I began to hope that things were going to be okay. And be- But before he let me out, he said, I'll tell Jack what you said and see what he wants. But if I were you, I'd take the dough and scarper. So he let me out. And Leslie's father, Jack, had always been overprotective of his only child, and lately Leslie would sneak out of the house. And what was she up to? Anyway, he got this private detective to check up on me, and he couldn't find much. And he even went to Hargrave Street once. Jack actually had a rifle in his car, (coughs) and he went to Hargrave Street once (coughs) when I wasn't there. And John Sandy and a few of his friends were at home and Jack knocked on the door and then burst in with the rifle and said, where's Leslie? And John Sandy was a pretty cool cat. He said, oh, never heard of a man, never heard of her. What you doing here? He said, I don't want my Leslie coming here. He says, no, man, we'd never heard of her. Beat it. You know, he was real cool, John Sandy. And Jack's, Jack's guts were churning with imaginations. Was Les a nymphomaniac? Was she a marijuana addict? <clears throat> if only she'd talk to him a bit. He sent her to a psychiatrist, but she still didn't really open up to Jack. Uh, he imagined her out there bouncing like a pinball from man to man. He had to find out. <clears throat> One day he followed up and Leslie lost him by running down the subway steps at Museum Station <clears throat> and running along the track all the way to Museum Station. <laughs> <clears throat> and Jack, uh, he didn't have the, uh, the, the wherewithal of running along the ru- subway track through the subway, so... Les lost him, and, uh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, where where, 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 yeah, yeah, what, around midnight I'd just left the piccolo bar when an angry looking, because I'd never seen Jack, and an angry looking guy, middle-aged bloke, walked towards me. He stared right at me face. So I moved over to give him passing room and then he shot out a right jab and it just struck me on the forehead lightly. It just missed and another just missed my cheek and I skipped backward and scurried behind a parked car. With that mass between us, I said, What's wrong, man? What you picking on me for? And he tried getting close but I moved around the car and customers came out of the piccolo bar and they were yelling out, Kill him, Kaz. <clears throat> and another said, leave the kid alone, man. They were enjoying the drama. And I thought, well, I can keep this up all night if he wants to. But then he calmed down and he explained who he was and he took me to a pizza joint. And I was very hungry at the time and he offered to buy me a pizza. So I had a pizza, ham and, ham and pineapple. It's the only one I like. I frantically tried to convince him that I was not a drug user and that I cared about his daughter. He began telling me her problems and saying she has no sense of consequences, which was true. And it took an hour, but I persuaded him that I was not a junkie and that Leslie would be better off with me than some of the other rat bags around town. So Jack came up with an offer that I should stay at their place. Then I can keep an eye on you, he said, and Leslie won't sneak out at night. So he drove me to Ranwick. I never said goodbye to the hippies. 
because Leslie was my main concern at that time in my life. And I moved into the spare room way out the back of their palatial Randwick home. It was a laundry, actually, but they had a little bed set up in there, <coughs> a single bed. That wouldn't stop me. Uh, and, uh, and two nights later, Leslie left her bedroom and joined me in the little tiny bedroom and we usually slept together every couple of nights and her parents accepted the arrangement, at least to my face. Leslie introduced me then to a new but growing subculture, awareness of our internal organs and sensual mechanics could be realised in half a dozen LSD trips instead of a five-year study of tantric yoga and kundalini introspection, particularly if you use the drugs with religious reverence. In 1967, the Sydney Drug Squad consisted only of five cops, Bates, Astle, Coleman, Kirkham and Silk. It was only when the squad caught you red-handed with dope that they'd know for sure that you're a user because uh, until there was no laws written about the use of LSD <clears throat> in 1967. There was no law against it because most people didn't even know it existed. 